Hello, everyone. This is uh, my name is Gabby Winkle, and I am delighted to introduce you, welcome you to High Ridge House's monthly metaphysical meeting. Tonight, today's speaker is Nicole Virgil from Elmhurst, Illinois, which is a subway of Chicago, sub, suburb of Chicago. She attended Christian Science Center School while growing up in Southwestern Connecticut. She studied piano, voice, and opera before finally deciding to pursue a career in opera, which she did by pioneering That Can't Be Opera, a one woman opera review program. Eventually, she combined singing opera with her hobby of making handmade soap and started marketing her soap through soap opera parties where she would sing, tell opera stories, and sell soap. She entered the public practice of Christian Science in 2005. She's been a member of Christian Science branch churches in many states, serving on the board as first and second reader, Sunday school teacher, soloist, and of course, on a variety of committees. Her recent article, also titled Neutralizing Racism with Truth, appeared in the June 2021 issue of the Christian Science Journal. We are so thrilled to have her with us today at High Ridge House. And let me just welcome our speaker, Nicole Virgil, who I will now ask to unmute. And there we go. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Hey. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me, Gabby. I am, I'm excited about this opportunity to meet so many of you guys out there in the field rowing the boat. So um, it's nice to see you all. And I'm happy to share some ideas with you that I've been thinking about for a while on this topic of racism and neutralizing racism. And uh, as, as Gabby mentioned, this started off uh, as an article uh, so today's talk is going to be an expansion of that article. Uh, the article has a lot of the references in it, if you have the June journal. Um, if not, uh, I can put together uh, an additional reference list afterwards if anybody wants anything that's not originally in the, the article. But most of, most of the references will be in, um, in the article if you look at the June journal. So um, this topic of racism, it's it's touchy for a lot of people, isn't it? It's kind of uh, charged emotionally and the perspectives range the gamut from hurt and defensive to willfully ignorant and callous to shocked and horrified. It's kind of all over the map. Thankfully, Christian science shines the light on how we can sort this out and see through the fog and bless mankind. So much of what is said on the topic of race today is based on the evaluation of man as material. And this is gonna be a non-starter for us as Christian scientists, of course. We don't care what matter claims or doesn't claim about man. We don't care at all. Mortal mind suggests that we can be separated into groups, which results in minority communities, and these being the people who are marginalized, discriminated against, and mistreated, and then the larger group of people being dominant and potentially oppressive. For those um, whose evaluations are based on material sense, the view of these minority communities is, can be quite bleak. Experience shows that the freest people are the ones who see and live according to principle, capital P. And this always seems to draw the displeasure of that portion of society still steeped in mortal reasoning. After all, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, meaning they didn't do anything wrong. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the idea being that you don't have to worry about people who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, not will be. It is the kingdom of heaven. So while the world belief, while world belief argues that mistreated people are oppressed victims, that's not what the demonstration bears out. Jesus was scoffed at, derided, misunderstood, and abused. But could he really be oppressed, kept down? Didn't the hatred of the Christ 
serve to deepen Jesus' intimacy with God and lead to his ascension? Didn't the hatred of the Christ truth and the attempt to kill Jesus show the disciples exactly what they needed to see to arouse them from their material sense of Jesus' career? And didn't all that and didn't all of that lead to the worldwide ability to see Christianity and eventually see Christian science? What about Nelson Mandela? He was certainly unjustly imprisoned. He was a victim of racism for decades. For what? For the crime of speaking the truth while being black. But they couldn't get to him. They could not make him be embittered, sour, or resentful. He loved his way through the ordeal. He even loved the prison guards. And as a result, he triumphed. He did all that through the understanding of and desire to overcome evil with good. So if Nelson can do what he did in a locked cell without a science and health, surely we can love those who seem to be as unlovable as those who imprisoned him. Man is always free, free to love. Many argue that the mistreated party is justified in their anger, that destruction and frustration are understandable responses to oppression, discrimination, and racism. They are not. In the calculus of divine truth, man is spiritual, perfect. There is nothing incendiary in us that would have the capacity to return evil for evil. To light a match or start a fire, there has to be something inside the material capable of burning. The substance of God's man does not contain any such material, anything that can burn with the rage of victimhood and self-righteous hurt. God's child knows who he is, unoppressed, upright, and free. His physical location, like Nelson in a jail cell, or particular circumstance, vilified, attacked, and derided like Jesus, does not inform or impact God's child. How so? Because God's child lives and moves and has his being in God, good, and he knows it. It's not a stretch to say that the wrath of man shall praise thee. So how much concern need we have about the power of evil to do harm? Mrs. Eddy tells us in Science and Health, the only power of evil is to destroy itself. The remaining influence must always collaborate towards good, whether we can see it or not. Of course, racism, hate, oppression, et cetera, are not by themselves worthy goals or desirable states of mind to reside in. The point is not that we justify them or turn a blind eye to those who would promulgate them, but that we see that they can't accomplish anything because they possess no power, because there is no power but God, and he is good. And that's the basis of Christian science. If God is all, and he is, then racism has no power and is therefore not a threat. This truth is scientific and available to all to practice today. Right reasoning does not allow for the suggestion that God has a competitor or a challenger. We speak about errors of all kinds, not to establish that they have any substance, they don't, nor to admit some kind of adversary onto the playing field. These are terms that describe phases of nothingness. Like we use the term boogeyman, not because we think there is one, but to describe a belief in something that is not for the purpose of clarifying the fact that there is nothing to be afraid of, nothing. Racist beliefs and the mayhem they cause depend on a material analysis of man. In Science and Health, we read, quote, the scriptures inform us that man is made in the image and likeness of God. Matter is not that likeness. Man is idea, the image of love. He is not physique. If you are impressed with the physical image of me that you see on the screen, more than the ideas and the individual expression of those ideas, then you're missing me. I am not the image you see, whether in two dimensions on the screen or three dimensions in person. Mrs. Eddy told us, quote, those who look for me in person 
or elsewhere than in my writings lose me instead of find me. I hope and trust that you and I may meet in truth and know each other there and know as we are known of God. That's in miscellany. So actually, there's not so many different ways to look at this topic. We're either considering people as mortals that can be hurt or hurtful, or seeing everyone as spiritual and therefore immunized against all forms of evil, including racism. I come, of, I come from a family, a large part of which strongly identifies with primarily being black. So I'm very familiar with the culture and the arguments that would have me identify as continuously victimized member of society. And based on the evidence of the material senses, this could seem logical, but I just can't do it. Christian science teaches me that God made man free and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I am not taught that God made me free temporarily or circumstantially based on the quality of thought of those around me or the regulatory state or the mental environment of society. God made me free, period. And so I am free. Mm. Here's an example of how this played out from my family and me. We were at the airport when my husband and I were separated due to his frequent flyer status. He travels a lot for work. So he and our son were routed through the express security line while our third grade daughter and I had to stay in the slowpoke line. <laughs> we placed our bags on the conveyor belt and the man in front of us turned around and threw our luggage on the floor, which is kind of weird. If you've ever been through airport security, people don't usually take your stuff off security off the belt and throw it on the floor. So I didn't say anything because that's kind of weird. Um, and I really didn't know what the problem was. So I just let the guy have more space and let him advance on the conveyor I'll let his items advance on the conveyor belt as he moved forward. And then we thought we'd just give it some room and we put our stuff back on the, the conveyor belt. Well, he actually walked back, took our stuff off a second time. His face was red at this point. He was pretty visibly angry and threw our stuff on the floor again. At this point, I was deliberately calm, not knowing exactly what his concern was. And I spoke with an even tone voice and I asked him, is there a problem? He was waving his hands and coming closer towards me. I put my kid behind me with my arms just to keep her out of the fray. And as he was inching towards me, he's screaming in my face. Yeah, there's a problem. You're the problem. You and your people are the problem. Well, I didn't assume that he knew I was from Connecticut. So I didn't think he was talking about nutmeggers. <laughs> he was talking about black people, right? So he went on for a while in a pretty ugly racially charged tirade, waving his arms. The airport was packed and no one came to assist us. As a side note, my husband is white and these things don't ever happen when he is around, ever. So since we are not attached at the hip, I've learned how to deal with these things individually or on my own. So I keep a few things in my back pocket and like all of you loving Christian science, as we study daily, you have some things that become your favorites. And here's a couple of mine. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. People are not our refuge. God is. And God was with me. Another one from Science and Health, very simple. I love her short sentences in Science and Health. They're great, they cut to the chase. She says, evil is not power, period. <laughs> Don't you love that? Like, okay, <laughs> I'll go with that. <laughs> uh, so I stood still, I didn't do anything else. Um, I was just knowing these truths, keeping my daughter behind me. He stopped yelling, he turned around and proceeded through the security screening process. My daughter and I exited the area without further incident and met up with my husband and son. I was so grateful for the freedom I felt from a circumstantial and potentially perpetual feeling of victimization. See, animal magnetism always argues these three things. It wants to argue a victim, a perpetrator, and an audience. A victim, a perpetrator, and an audience. 
don't be any of those things. And then animal magnetism doesn't have you. So it was trying to argue that I was a victim. It couldn't. Science shows us that there is actually no party to racism. There is no victim. There is no perpetrator. There is no witness. So let's get into it in terms of the perpetrator. We'll start there. Personal sense always tries to stick evil to something. It, it can't exist, right? God didn't make it. So I think of it kind of like Velcro. You know, um, Velcro has to have something to stick to. If you try to stick Velcro to a refrigerator, it doesn't work, it slides off. And so um, personal sense would argue that evil needs to stick to a person or an event, something to make it personal to you. If it's not personal, it doesn't seem real and then you don't buy it and there's no evil. So the real perpetrator is not actually a person or a man or a woman, the real perpetrator is the lie of the material senses. Material sense testimony perpetuates the myth that we are material, separated from God, sorted into groups based on color or culture, and we possess minds of our own with which we can commit evil or suffer from it. Wherever this belief is allowed to take hold, it wreaks havoc until corrected by divine truth which asserts that we possess the innocent and invulnerable mind of Christ, blessing all and injuring none. Spiritual sense testimony is impersonal, universal, applicable to everyone equally. So since God made me good, he made the man in the airport good. He had to be, regardless of what the material sense is claimed. I can't be a victim because God didn't make me one. And the man in the airport can't be a perpetrator because God is the only cause and there is no power apart from him to perpetrate anything. It has nothing to do with skin color and everything to do with spirit. Again, the knowledge of our unity with God is gained solely through the spiritual senses. This can't be remembered too often. The human experience is constantly suggesting that matter or material evidence is imperative, it's required to consider for one reason or another. But we can follow the science, the science of Christ, right? Although our leader, Mary Baker Eddy, experienced hatred and discrimination, she refused to recognize individual people as the enemy or perpetrators of evil. She saw man's true nature as spiritual, incapable of offense or harm, and she always responded to those who opposed her with Christly love. In an essay titled, Love Your Enemies, Mrs. Eddy asks the reader, who is thine enemy that thou shouldst love him? Is it a creature or a thing outside thine own creation? Can you see an enemy except you first formulate this enemy and then look upon the object of your own conception? What is it that harms you? Can height or depth or any creature separate you from the love that is omnipresent good that blesses infinitely one and all? Of course not. A perusal of human history would try to impress us with evidence of injustice and discrimination, man's inhumanity to man. This narrative is not of God's creation, of course, but of the Adam dream, and therefore no proof of man's real state. This narrative often leads to feelings of anger, distrust, bitterness, and a sense of desperation. Wallpapering over these feelings by ignoring them won't help. Science does not simply say peace, peace when there is no peace. Neither can we indulge the suggestion that man is at the mercy of historical events. As children of God, we have the divine authority and obligation to reject this imposition because it is false. Man is the highest idea of God. He's not vulnerable. He never was. He will not be. He is free to love his way to ascendancy over evil as we have observed in the experience of Jesus, Mary Baker Eddy, Nelson Mandela, and countless others. 
no circumstance can limit man's intuitive natural capacity to overcome evil with good. Whether one is suffering from a belief of being a victim or the equally erroneous belief of being a perpetrator of racism, divine love meets the human need. Love corrects what has no rightful place in thought. The stains of bitterness, distrust, and resentment may try to linger, but they cannot exist in the consciousness of those who understand that divine love and love's idea are susceptible only to good. Mary Baker Eddy says, the enslavement of man is not legitimate. It will cease when man enters into his heritage of freedom, his God-given dominion over the material senses. Notice, she does not say that the enslavement of man will cease when certain political action is taken, although government should certainly express principle. Nor does she say that the enslavement of man will cease when enough people take up advocacy work, although advocacy work is certainly sometimes commendable. It will cease. What will cease? The enslavement of man will cease wherever and whenever man enters his heritage of freedom and demonstrates dominion over, not indulgence of material sense testimony. The greater seems to be the injustice, the more pressing the demand on us for us to bear witness to truth, not my truth, not your truth, not variable truth, divine truth, the actual truth. The only truth, the purpose of prayer in Christian science is to bear witness to absolute truth, God, which heals injustice as well as sickness. We read in Science and Health, to enter into the heart of prayer, the door of the erring senses must be closed. Lips must be mute and materialism silent, that man may have audience with spirit, the divine principle love which destroys all error. When we personalize injustice, giving it a cause, a name, face, or event, we make a reality of the untruth or evil. Mrs. Eddy once said that error has no life and it comes to you for life and you give it all the life it has in belief. So let's not, <laughs> let's not do that. Moses' commandment from God, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, indicates that we are to bear witness only to what God knows and has created, what spiritual sense reveals. It is not more scientific to like someone because they are black than it is to hate someone because they are black. Today, there is a bandwagon which wishes to promote people because they have a certain skin tone and to be skeptical of people who have a fairer disposition. But what about spiritual sense? How is this material method of evaluation possibly legitimate? It can't be. Jesus beheld in science the perfect man, not the perfect white man or the perfect black man. Once upon a time, general belief supported the ill treatment of people based on their skin tone. The correction is not to treat them well because of their skin tone. The correction is to stop evaluating people based on skin tone and start paying attention to the substance of their individual nature, which cannot be seen with the material eye, but is always good. Have you heard some of these things said before? You know, black people have so much soul. Love, heart, expression, creativity are functions of God, not ethnicity or cultural background. Or maybe you've heard, Asian people are so smart. Intelligence is not a function of Asian culture or educational patterns or their skin tone. It's a function of divine mind. You get the idea. We do not attribute good to people because of their skin tone, nor do we take anything away from people because of their skin tone. It's wholly irrelevant. We must not allow ourselves to attribute God's good to some other racial, cultural, or human source. There is one source, and that is God. Incidents of racism can be so shocking 
as to cause a mental retreat. It's easy to turn away in horror or denial. Courage is required to stand up to the lie and handle it honestly, accurately, scientifically. Not to handle the person or event, but to handle the lie. The lie can't be handled if personal sense is so enraged with the individual or the person that the lie hides in the weeds. Christian scientists must be clear to handle the lie and not shy away from it out of discomfort or fear. This is the too little that Mrs. Eddy talks of when she says in miscellaneous writings, mankind thinks either too much or too little of sin. No matter how tempting, evil must not be ignored. We cannot turn away and make too little of sin. When God instructed Moses to cast his shepherd's rod on the ground, it turned into a serpent, symbolizing the lie of evil. Terrified by the sight, he fled. But God commanded that he return, pick up the snake, handle the lie, and overcome his fear of it. When he did, the suggestion, uh, I'm sorry, when he did, the snake turned into a rod again, demonstrating the impotence of the serpentine suggestion because God, good, is all the power there is. To neutralize racism, we have to take up the snake that presents itself to us, the material sense suggestion that man is separated into cliques based on his skin tone or other physical attributes. First, we must see the lie. Then we must apply the truth, reversing the lie and reducing it to nothing, no threat, no harm. If we have the courage sufficient to handle it, this demonstration will be a staff upon which we can lean, namely the understanding that evil is not power because God good is all. Alternately, there is no point of building sin up and making too much of it either. Sin is a negation of truth, not a solid object, power, position, or place. In miscellaneous writings, we read, Christian science never healed a patient without proving that with mathematical certainty that error when found out is two thirds destroyed and the remaining third destroys itself. Here are the errors that need to be found out. One, the error that man can be hurt or is susceptible to harm. All men are spiritual and therefore not susceptible to material so-called forces. Two, that one group of people is more powerful than another group of people. God good is the only power. Three, that people can be judged good or bad based on something other than their spiritual identity. If we want to know who people really are, we have to look at who they really are as God sees them. There's no need to beat at it. Error is just a term, not a powerful thing. It is useful to watch in today's climate that we don't beat at racism, maintaining an ongoing frustration, irritation, disgust, or disappointment with racist persons or injustice, so-called. To be useful, we have to see the error, the lie, understand that it's not a threat. So why make such a big deal out of it? Let it be what it is, nothing. Okay, so there's a couple of modern terms I'd like to review here. Um, these terms are in the popular discourse right now, those being white guilt and white privilege. First, let's do white guilt. Um, this term is defined as a sense of guilt stemming from, quote, the sense of responsibility for others' racist attitudes or behavior. If we're going to evaluate mankind through spiritual means alone, we have to take it all the way. Each individual has the obligation to work out their own salvation. You cannot carry someone else's luggage. We call that false responsibility in Christian science. That's a belief that's to be healed, not to be indulged. Our tenant states that the belief in sin is punished so long as the belief lasts, sure. But that's only for the one who believes it. <laughs> so... Just because you have a certain skin tone doesn't mean you need to have guilt 
for beliefs that you're not believing. <laughs> we Christian scientists are tasked with self-knowledge. We must know ourselves, our thoughts. When we find error in consciousness, of course, we must not tolerate it. It has to go. On the other hand, when we're innocent of some belief, we do not enter a deeper state of the Adam dream in order to absorb and become impressed with a lie that someone else is believing, good grief. A white person is no more susceptible to racism just because of their skin color than anyone else. Human circumstance or whiteness, so-called, does not dictate the quality of someone's consciousness. If you are not believing in some sin, then there is no reason for you to suffer guilt for it simply because you are white. Again, God made man free. What would be the point in practicing purity and innocence if you were obliged to suffer the guilt from other people's actions in spite of your own demonstrated purity? This has to stop. I love this line in miscellaneous writings. To punish ourselves for another's faults is superlative folly. I'll say that again. To punish ourselves for another's faults is superlative folly. Spiritual goodness is its own defense. Okay, the next term, white privilege. According to the Webster's Dictionary, privilege is a particular and peculiar benefit or advantage enjoyed by a person, company, or society beyond the common advantages of other citizens. Okay, so in science, we always have to um, tell between the tares and the wheat, right? We have to find the real and then recognize the counterfeit. So let's do that here with white privilege. There is a real sense of privilege, but we have to identify the right one. It's not white privilege. That would be a counterfeit privilege. <laughs> Hear this. There is only one kind of privilege. That's the privilege of being God's beloved child. The privilege of having dominion over the whole earth given to us in Genesis. The privilege of divine liberty from sin, disease, and death. Any other privilege is imagined lacking in substance, consequence, or value. Counterfeit privilege, some kind of privilege other than that which is God bestowed, is not worth the time to discuss it. Even if you or someone else thinks it provides some advantage or perceived advantage, it cannot. Even if you have some kind of alternate privilege, financial, positional, white, you will, one way or another, find that this imagined privilege is no privilege at all. If society is telling you that you do not possess one of these bogus privileges, no matter, don't worry about it, they have no value and transmit no substantial benefit either way. So think not one more moment about it. Get about the business of claiming and expressing the one true privilege, the blessing and privilege of being the child of God. Jesus had no societal privilege, no home, no fancy place to stay. And he was generally mistreated by all in power and many not in power. Was he lacking privilege? Was he lacking anything? You notice in Christian science that we take individual cases. We do not expect to call a practitioner and have them summarize our thought based on our group affiliations. You wouldn't expect to call a practitioner in here. Okay, you're above average height, you're Irish, female, firstborn, large family, college educated, trauma survivor. Okay, now I know who you are. We wouldn't do that, right? We don't group people by their affiliations. The Christian scientist works with each unique case of an individual. We're not the Borg. Each child of God is individual. We find our highest sense of freedom in the expression of our unique God-given attributes, not the generalities of human affiliation. 
It is not correct to paint all people, doesn't matter who they are, white, black, green, purple, with a broad brush of, oh, you don't get it just because you're white or you feel it because you're black or whatever. This would be to negate the individual capacity to commune with divine mind. And it would make their getting it or comprehension level dependent upon group think or group experience. Certainly as Christian scientists, we can't say that white skin and the relative experiences pertaining to that aspect of one human's experience, one's human experience impact a person more than their own divine mind, God, can we? Last summer, when racial tensions reached a tipping point, riots broke out around the country and I received a slew of texts and emails from people worried about my safety and mental state. They told me they understood the pain that I must be in as a black woman and that they were sorry. While their concern for my well being was appreciated, it assumed a mental state that I do not occupy. I was not in pain. I am not black, Nicole. I am Nicole. That's plenty. Christian science has given me the gift of a family not determined by blood and race, a spiritual understanding of selfhood and identity in which human heritage, circumstances, and physical characteristics do not and cannot define. Thinking about people or holding your friends, Americans and citizens of the world in thought as hurt, victimized, oppressed creatures does nothing to support their liberty. Continually thinking of groups of people as disenfranchised minorities contributes to a sense of loneliness and isolation on their part, which breeds anger, resentment, us, them thinking, and it's not good, we should not do that. Please do not throw your weight on that side of the scale. The truth is that there is only one family, as Jesus mentioned, those that do the will of my father. And we all do the will of our father because there's only one will, his. What does that have to do with skin tone? God made man free and we are, all of us. We are subject to divine love and nothing else. The best thing you can do for all mankind is to love them scientifically, follow the real science. The antidote for the oppression of one group of people is not the sympathy or guilt of another group of people, but the compassion that recognizes the spiritual innocence and independence of all people. Jesus' mission was to uplift thought to the understanding that we are the upright, free, children of divine spirits creating. Each of us is equally worthy and infinitely blessed. The notion that race confers value or status, guilt or innocence is a fraud. Don't be impressed or horrified by it. See it for what it is, nothing. And know the truth that sets us all free. That's all I have today. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you so much. Let me start my video. And where am I? Okay. All right, thank you so much, Nicole. That was incredible. So much to think about, so much to ponder. Uh, and I just want to open it up. If you would like to say something, I'm going to look at what the chat says. Um, from Katie Smiley. Thank you. Wonderful talk. From Laura Molitor. Molitor, wonderful. From Italy Colors, Melissa. Thank you. It was a beautiful lecture. From Grace Duffy, this should be delivered worldwide. And you can tell everyone that it, you can hear it again on highridgehouse.org. Diane Collier, truly excellent. Would anyone like to say anything from the group? I'm happy to answer questions. I know I covered 
a lot of different vantage points. If anyone wants me to clarify anything, I'm happy to. I just thought it was fantastic and on point. And I'm grateful that uh, High Ridge House allowed this to happen. This kind of voice and this perception it needed. Thank you. And in the chat, Susan is asking, can we get a written copy? Well, we can remind Susan of the article in the June journal. Um, and, and you'll have the video up. And we'll have the video. So uh, wonderful talk, best lecture for a long time. Absolutely wonderful. This was so truly wonderful and welcome. Does anyone have, oh, someone's raised a hand. Now I have to see who that is who's raised a hand. Oh, Osceola, thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, it's Osceola, who else? Nikki. Okay. <laughs> uh, my camera's not on because I haven't been to the hairdresser today, so that's okay. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> but Nicole, that was, well, that was a, Wonderful, wonderful lecture, talk. It was much needed. It was delivered with love. It was delivered with, with divine guidance and experience. Mm -hmm. And I understand exactly what you're saying because I too have been in situations like that. But may God bless you and your family and just continue on as we used to say, keep on keeping on. Thank you so much for sharing your, your thought with us today. Thanks, hon. And Thanks from, for saying that. From Marilyn Bradshaw, one of our trustees. Nicole, thank you so much. You got right to the bottom line and uncovered and handled it all. And your metaphysics have application to so much beyond yeah, racism. It was it. awesome. Thank you so much, needed. And Lynette, Moro has a question. So Lynette, would you like to verbalize it? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and oh, clear. Great. Thank you, Nicole, for your clear statement of principle. Um, I do have a kind of a um, sort of putting it to practice question because um, my eyes were opened many years ago as I became a bilingual teacher. And because of that, we had a whole lot of quote unquote race training. And I realized that I was unaware of a lot of the situation that um, others might be going through uh, of race. And um, I am currently have been for 12 years, almost more than, more than that, but in the particular, I'm in a black gospel choir that is um, primarily <laughs> white because as I'm sure you know most um, uh, black people have their own church choir they don't need a community choir um, but this is a choir that is almost 40 years old and we interact with the african-american community and recently because of the pandemic you cannot have a choir because you cannot sing together because zoom has a delay so the choir director who is black had decided to put on a Black history, uh, uh, I mean, a um, history of gospel music class that went on for several months. And it was very much entwined with the civil rights movement. And race has always been the elephant we don't talk about in the room. So now we were talking about it. And coming from a, there are probably four or five Christian scientists in the choir. And, um, at the end, and I did a lot of contributing to the discussion because I had had a lot of information and background on it, but it, finally at the end, I said to the director, because he, he's a young guy of 32, said he had been studying this and was immersed in the pain and suffering of the black history of slavery and oppression. And I finally said to him, you know, how do black people think about this? Do they think of themselves as hanging on to oppression or do they think of themselves as 
moving forward and being free. And he said, well, it's the gamut. And I said, because I don't want to think about you as associated with uh, racism as oppression and oppression. I want to think of you as free. And that's the whole point of the civil rights movement, if you're going to look at it that way, is to see yourselves free. And and we um, we are all Christians. I didn't bring up Mary Baker Eddy, but everybody was happy. But how do you, the 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 interacting with others is not always so black and white. You know, you have no pun intended, but you have to reach people where they are. And this was a big. Um, development in this choir. We had never had these discussions, you know, and um, anyway, this is a long question, but it's, um, you know, you can be, it's like the Good Samaritan, you can, the two people walked by the side of the road and didn't do anything, but one stopped and saw the hurt and took care of it. So, you know, um, I just wondered if you could address that somehow. <laughs> Is your question how to not appear callous? Yeah, I mean, if you, it can appear that way. And sometimes you have to, um, you know, you have to show that you understand. Okay, so you, I mean, this can be a bigger conversation, but let me, for the sake of this, um, presentation, just address it in a, in a little bite. Um, if you want to call me, my number's in the journal. <laughs> but, <laughs> but for the purposes of this uh, conversation, I'll just say... Yeah, sure, I get it. Um, talking about the truth or talking about love is not the same as loving. Mrs. Eddy does not train us to talk the truth. The Bible does not say speak the truth. It says know the truth. And you could, not, you could be a person who doesn't even speak English. In fact, we see this in um, Francis Thurber Seale's account of Christian science in Germany where she does not speak the language and yet people are healed and understand the testimony she's giving and they don't speak English. Love speaks. You're, you don't need words as much as you need the substance of soul. If you have the substance of soul, it is felt, period, because it's the only substance there is. There, there is nothing else that resonates, not with the human heart, not with mankind. It's love, it's soul, it's truth. To know that and live that and to breathe it, it permeates not only your experience, but the thoughts of anyone upon whom your thoughts rest. Feel it. With that basis of living Christian science, how many words do you think you would need? None, really. Yeah. So seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, the knowing of truth and all those other things shall be added. Yeah, that's the substance of it for sure. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I see a little, I see a few little hands. Mary, would Mary like to say something? Well, I- oh, 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 This oh, is Mary. Mary or Marilyn? Oh, it was Mary no, first Marilyn. and then Marilyn. All right, my, my question really is technical. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a friend in uh, the west side of Chicago whom I know would love this address, but I don't think she has a computer and I'm wondering if there's a way to telephone in. And if, if there is, maybe you could send it to me by email. Sure, um, Mary. Was... Why don't you just uh, send me a note at info at highridgehouse.org. Just simple okay. info. And I'll okay. see what I can do, okay? Sure. And you're Gabby, right? I am Gabby, right. Uh, info at highridgehouse.com, dot org. Org, right. org. Yeah, dot org. Thank you very much. Thank and you. You're welcome. Marilyn, you're up. Is that it's me? Is that me? Yes. Oh, is it? I was 
Okay, this is Mary, but I guess oh. maybe there's two Marys. Oh, yes, yeah. Mary and a Marilyn. Let's go with Marilyn Keller first and then the second Mary. Oh, that was okay. Mary was already on. I didn't mean to butt her off. <laughs> oh, okay. No, you did, you did not. So I'm going now, though. <laughs> I'd love to have Go her. ahead. Go ahead. That's okay. I can go next. Okay, Marilyn Keller. <laughs> okay. Well, um, Nicole, thank you so much for those wonderful spiritual thoughts. I'm even tearing up with gratitude as I speak because um, I was taking mental notes um, across the lines of spiritual sense because even though I my skin is white, I also have the um, starting to get the labels of being a senior citizen and some of those um, limitations that fall on that prejudice in the way of like driving skills and um, fear that you're going to lose this and that. And as my spiritual perception increases, I find, I'm not saying this to brag, but sometimes I feel like I have more spiritual perception than somebody that's 20 something zooming across five lanes of traffic without looking back or looking side to side. And um, your message about dominion over material sense to spiritual sense, um, substituting soul, it just, it spoke to my soul. So your um, beautiful message just cut across all material sense um, labels. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening, Marilyn. It's nice to meet you. You too. And our next Mary. Thank you. I think there was two Marys, but anyway. Um, Nicole, first of all, thank you so much for that talk. Um, it's like I've been really waiting to hear that. Um, I live in a neighborhood where I hear all the time. Um, we have demonstrations at least once a week and I hear all, you know, Black Lives Matter. And then I'm Asian, so I want to say all lives matter, you know, um, but I'm, I'm like kind of afraid to say that. Yep. Like, like I'm not allowed to say that. Yep. Um, so just to hear from a Christian science and that we're all like, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter is, is just to hear it from somebody else is really, um, it's really moving. And my question is, and you may have answered this, is that um, as an Asian, um, I came with my family from Korea. So not only do I look Asian, you know, my parents, um, the cult, I'm also culturally, like that's what I was raised in. And when I go back to Korea, I get a lot of, um, you're not Korean enough. And when I'm here with other Koreans, and this is mostly family, um, I'm too like American or, oh no, no, I'm sorry. When I'm in Korea, I'm too American. And then when I'm here, it's like, I'm not, like, um, I don't know, just like, just, this is family. <laughs> you know, people I love, not strangers, sort of doing some kind of um, pigeonholing on what I look like um, and culture. And I was just wondering, um, you, you had said like, to be loving and maybe that's the answer but i my question is do you ever encounter that when someone says you're not black enough or you're too black or you know something like yeah um yeah. i i do? um sure i was raised by a concert pianist i speak italian i sing opera um i was called an oreo cuz they said i was too white I was dark on the outside and white on the inside. Um, mm -hmm. I got banana. But yeah, the, 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 you have to get to the point where, I mean, cause that's the lie. I'm not an Oreo, <laughs> you're not a banana. I right, was also called right. zebra. That's the lie part, right? The part is, the thing is I'm Nicole. 
And you don't judge yourself based on other people's images of you. What other people think of you is none of your business. What God thinks of you is what is true. What God thinks of you is what is true. Thy will, God's will be done. All these human wills. She says, I again, I told you I like the short sentences in science and health. She has a really short sentence in science and health. Human opinion is valueless. Mm. Yes, I remember that. That's Where are you putting that in the scale? It, it has no value. Well, are you measuring it some sort of way? It's valueless. So yes, I, I'm familiar with all of those things. Um, I had very light-skinned cousins who were considered more attractive than me who would tell me I was too dark or this or that, whatever. Like it's all valueless. It's all, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. yeah it, even, you know, even it doesn't family. mean anything. It doesn't matter yeah. who it is. Right. It's all you got human, one. You got one it. family, those that do the will of your father. Right. And you are amongst some of them here today. <sighs> Thank breathe, you. Breathe, girl, breathe. You're yeah. good. That's so good to hear. Thank you so much. Thanks for your question. Um, Gabby, I see a woman here, Avis has had her physical hand up. She might not know how to put her. Oh, well, Avis, hand please up. chime in. She's on mute though. Okay, let me- Avis, you gotta me. unmute. Let me find Avis. Avis, Avis. Oh, I'm here. Hi, there Avis. It was, it was so wonderful, so practical, and so go out and use it. <laughs> um, what happened to the airport? Uh, well, I, I'm not going to retell the whole story now, but it is summarized yeah. in the in the article in the June Journal. If you if you for anyone who came in late, it, there's a summary of it in the article in the June 2021 Journal. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful talk. Thank you. And here's a um, are there there's an, uh, another question in the chat that says, um, how did you respond to the people who checked in on you? How did you let them know you were fine or did you? Oh, <laughs> well, it was kind of funny. Um, they all started, it, it was, I think the day after the George Floyd situation when it really started, my phone really started to explode. Um, emails, texts, Facebook, instant message and it, they started coming in really like close together and we were in the car and my phone was just going ding 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 you know like over and I I must have done something like hmm or what hmm, hmm. like I must have made some noise or something and and my kids my daughter said what what's going on and I explained that people were worried about me and thought I was in pain and she she, she just broke the mesmerism she said well, tell them we're on our way to dinner and you're not in pain. You're just going to have a nice dinner. <laughs> and so that made me kind of chuckle about it. Um, and of course, I respond to anyone who reaches out to me. And I just would say, depending upon how close I was with them, if it was just someone who knew me from the community, I would say, thank you for your concern. It's very nice. Some people had very extensive messages talking about their family's history in the civil rights movement and marching in the 60s and you could see there was quite a burden in some people's hearts. So I didn't get into anything specific with them. I just thanked them for their words. My, my reason for mentioning it had more to do with my perception of what was happening rather than any trying to direct the people who were contacting me. So I hope that answers the question. And here's another question in the chat. How do you stand on the question of encouraging Christianly scientific prayer on racism. Is this a word prayer topic? I'm going to look in the chat because I did not follow. the. <laughs> okay. How do you stand on the question of encouraging Christianly scientific prayer? Uh, well, I, I would encourage it. Um, is this a world prayer topic? Uh, yeah, racism exists or the belief of it seems to be all over the world with different sects and different, you know, here it's black, white and other places it's Sunni, Shia or this or that, you know, 
Uh, mortal mind loves to group people into categories and then have people yell at each other. So yeah, that's a world prayer topic. Uh, I think the knowing is the best thing. It, talking is not usually as effective as knowing um, until such time that you know something well enough that you can, you know, like when you're learning how to write your name in cursive, you need to think real hard about doing it, but once it becomes fluent, then you can use it, right? Then it, it gets easier to use. So too with this type of pr prayer and this kind of topic where everybody's kind of emotionally charged about it and hypersensitive, running around talking about stuff is not, yes, necessarily that beneficial, at least until such time that you've developed a fluency with the ideas, a confidence level, uh, you know, Mrs. Eddy says, in order to be a fit counselor, counselor, you must be demonstrably right yourself. Demonstrably right yourself. So be demonstrably right. That's prayer. Right. And I think there's someone, and then I'm going to, because it's four o'clock and I want to okay. be prompt, but there's a Tama Santana who has a, who raised her hand. Would you like to ask her a question? Tama, are you out there? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Was hi. Wasn't wasn't um, necessarily a question. I, I wasn't. I wasn't sure. I mean, this has been such a great um, topic. I, I I would love for there to be more conversations like this. I am. I belong to First Church of Brooklyn, um, and just love our church so much. And um, it's great to hear another mom talking about her experiences um, through this and. Just, just wanted to, you know, as a reminder, I guess for myself, as you know, we're going through such complex discussions um, about matter or about who we are um, and and loving loving our neighbors. Just sort of shouting out to, to also um, loving ourselves, and um, that's a part of Christian Science work too, and in healing um, that maybe. Um, advertising or um, collective conscious, you know, thought has has told us that um, our hair or something should look different. Um, right. Embracing who I am as God's idea is also embracing my hair and my nose and and all those things and my culture and um, that's just been a, a a great part of science for me also. So I just sort of wanted to shout that out. Well, thank you, uh, Tama, and what a beautiful way to wrap up our wonderful afternoon with Nicole. And Nicole, I, I just cannot thank you enough uh, for all of you who've uh, tuned in and tell your friends. It'll, it's on our website. It should be up in about an hour and a half. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Nicole, and thank you all for coming and participating and i hope you all have a wonderful rest of your friday thank you so much thank you bye-bye thank you bye, -bye. Thank you. Thank you. bye, -bye.